My name is Eduardo Silva. I work for this company, which is called Treasure Data. And at Treasure Data, uh, we provide a service in the cloud where you can store data. Okay? I'm not going to do a sales pitch, but it's relevant for the context. So if you are selling a service where you're going to store data in the cloud, before to store the data, you need to collect the data. So in order to collect the data, we created a project which was called FluentD, like five, six years ago. And nowadays, FluentD is part of the CNCF. We always made the FluentD open source because most of the background of the company is open source. So there was no business reason to keep it closed. So why not make it open? And what happens, what happens later is that we had like, I don't know, many contributors using FluentD for their own purposes. And that's why it has grown. And then we gave out FluentD to, to the CNCF. And well, it continued to grow. So what I do basically on, on Treasure Data, I'm a software engineer. And I work with the Fluentd team, and also I'm a maintainer of Fluentbit project, which is a project that we mentioned this early this morning. And all about a related to Kubernetes, cloud native, performance, scalability. So this session, we're going to talk about logging. And as I said this morning, if we want to come up with a really good solution for logging, we need to understand the concepts behind it, OK? It's not that easy, as I said, I'm going to install uh, just a component, a product, and this will work magically. Well, at this point, it's not like that. Because if you have an environment which is scaling like crazy, you need to scale logging. So you need to understand how things work internally so you can adapt your own configuration, improve your performance, and make it more reliable. So monitoring exists because we want to monitor something or we, because we want to troubleshoot something. Logging is not just for troubleshooting because there are many applications in production which generate logging information but without statistics. Meaning, okay, uh, this is the data that my user is using, uh, my mobile game application, the, the user from that application, the, that game is, gener is moving to this phase, is purchasing this kind of information. And sometimes uh, in, the, in the server side, they use logging for that purpose. So it's also monitoring and troubleshooting. But if you think about a standalone application, how do they work? Basically, what they do is to write to a log file or write to a logging service like syslog or syslog or write to a remote service when they chip the log message from point A to point B. But from an operation, operational perspective, uh, sometimes things can get complex. Because if you have one application or two, that's fine. But if you have multiple applications in these multiple hosts, logging becomes more complex. And when we talk about the multiple hosts, multiple nodes, and those kind of things, we start talking about distributed systems. And that is something very relevant for the concept of Kubernetes and how do we design the architecture for our applications. So if your application is composed for multiple services, okay, sometimes we decouple application and make different small application, sometimes this application will run in different nodes. Nodes, I mean a host, a virtual machine. And this application and services also, as I said before, might scale. So from a logging perspective, we can have many sources of information. Also, each application, and I'm sure of that, has their own way to do logging. Think about that. You're going to have your production application. You hire one guy to develop one microservice. Other team, they develop a different service. And what is common is that they are not going to have the same way to do logging. And I mean formats. Login for that. Maybe everybody's running to the file system, which is pretty fine, it's pretty stable. But having different formats uh, is a pain. And let a company do, please, the whole development teams are going to use the same format, is hard. People will complain, and that does not happen. That is true. Not yet, at least. So if we have also an application, different applications, and we want to do some data analysis, we want to understand that some logs can come from application A, from host B, or from a different service, or a different cluster. So 
we need to add the notion of identity and that it's related to metadata. So if we jump into the cloud native space, this is okay. Cloud native is all about scaling, resiliency, but if we talk about cloud native logging, so we say that this is more complex. Distributed application is one thing, running a cluster of a hundred of nodes or more, even more complex. So we understand that we have a problem. We don't know yet how to solve it, but scale application also requires, requires to scale logging. So if we think about how to solve the problem in a cloud native space, we need to think about, okay, how can I consume the logs or the information from the application from different sources? Also, this information besides the format may, might have a structure or might not. If it doesn't have it, well, that means that we need to do some extra work. We need to enrich the logs with metadata, where these logs are coming from, and also we need to be able to deliver the logs to a central place for analysis. Because logging is not an end, right? Logging is just a tool that maybe we can use to take information from one side and centralize information on another side to do our own analysis. As I said many times, many people say that logging is boring, and it is, you know? It's logging because it happened behind the scenes. It's not like a dashboard, you know? Okay, you can, you can do Kibana stuff, log visualization, but that is after the storage, not in vain, the main while you are collecting the data. And that's why logging becomes complex because you don't have too much visibility from that, from that perspective. So who's familiar with uh, web server logs? Please raise your hand. Okay, an application like a web server log, okay, for who's not familiar, if you have a browser like Firefox, Chrome, that's the client side. But also you have the server side, which is the web server. A web server also is registering to the file system or any kind of logging mechanism who's accessing and what time is accessing and what kind of resource is trying to access. And of course, maybe accessing a resource could be successful, maybe it failed because the resource is not there or it does not have the right permissions to access to it. If we want to do log analysis for that special scenario, look at this. From one special case, that's fine. But if we have multiple applications in different places, that becomes hard. For example, in, in host A, we have three different web services. Okay, one of them, imagine, there's PHP, the other is Python, and the other maybe is Apache. But also we have a host B, which is running MySQL with a different format for the logs. So if we want to unify this information and do data analysis will become a lot of comp more complex. So how do we approach this? Because different sources, different applications, different log formats, different nodes, different hosts. So if you were here in the morning, in the keynote, we describe about the logging pipeline. Any kind of problem that you have, even in your life, or in software, software engineering, you need to come up with the right solution. If you understand the problem, you can implement the solution. And that is a software. A software is a component that tries to solve a problem. Uh, but before to write the software, sometimes we need to come up with a design. So the login pipeline said, okay, if you are going to work with data or any kind of login information, what do we need is to have different phases from where we have an input and output, but in the middle, we need to have extra phases to do some extra step. For example, in the input side of the login pipeline means about how do I collect the data? From where do I collect the information? And I mean from a perspective implementation, this means I'm going to tell from log files, I'm going to listen from TCP messages, I'm going to connect to a remote server to pull information, anything. Once you collect the information, you need to parse the data. And parsing means to give a sense or a structure to this information. As I said, data can come in different formats. But if you're going to have a, a login pipeline, you need to take this information and try to unify to a simple format, which you can understand. And then, of course, you can decode that information back 
to the destination format, like Elasticsearch needs a specific format, InfluxDB a different format. So we need to unify this, and that happens because you can parse the data. Once you parse the data, you need to filter the data. And filtering can mean drop messages, because sometimes you don't want to have everything. Uh, who's using Splunk here? One, two, three, four, five. Yeah, you didn't want, oh, okay, I use Splunk. And, and that's fine, Splunk is really good. The problem is a commercial strategy, right? Splunk is a database, a private database, so, and they, have, they implement also part of the pipeline. They skip the filtering, which is really fun. Why? Because when you have the Splunk database server, and you, you run the Splunk forwarders, which ships the logs to Splunk, there is a problem. They ship the whole data. And that has a reason, that you pay based on data ingestion. This is really smart. <laughs> you know, it's, it's really smart, it's really good. But for us, it's not. So that specific use case is keep the filtering part. Filtering can mean drop messages or just let pass these specific messages or also append some metadata. Buffering is such as important. Think about this. If I'm going to chip my logs to a separate place, which could be a local service in my network, in my cluster, or maybe a SaaS or any kind of service remote in the cloud, what would happen if I have some network outage? I cannot chip the logs. So I had to take some decisions. Do I want to lose data? No. Some people say, yeah, that's fine. I can lose data. It has terabytes. If I lose five megabytes, it's nothing. And that's OK. But 90% say, no, we need to have buffering. Why? Because if I'm going to route the data to multiple destina one or multiple destinations, if something happens, I want to be able to recover from that failure state and retry again. The thing is, everything can fail, and that is fine. Things fail. But you need to be able to recover from that state. So the question is, what's your default behavior when things go wrong? And for the login pipeline, you solve it with a good buffering, even in, or even in the file system or in memory. And of course, that's our end be able to centralize the whole logs in just one place. And this can be Elasticsearch, Splunk, Splunk, can be Apache Kafka, or any kind of storage. So, how's it going? It's the last talk. I know that everybody's tired, but let's try it. There's a concept which I mentioned before, which is called the unstructured data. When people generate logs, usually don't have a structure, okay? If you look at that red line, you will see that, oh, that is a web server log line. And you say, okay, that has a structure. Okay, for you, it has it. Because you know that that is an IP address, you know that you have a time stamp when that message was generated, what's the HTTP method, the, the resource that you want to access, the URI, the protocol that was used on that moment, the return status code, and how many bytes were returned to the client. So you understand, this has a structure. But in your mind, but if you give that string to a computer, it will say, OK, this is a byte string. That's it. There's no structure. Unless to, uh, you add some kind of logic on top of that. So if we think about this, wouldn't it be better to have a structure? Because think that your goal is to do data analysis. And if your goal is to do data analysis, you want to say, please return me back the whole records that has a status 200. And to accomplish that, it will be better to have a structure. And here, I'm not just talking about JSON. I'm just I'm talking about a general structure, where you can have a map, a sense of key values, so with that information, any kind of storage or storage engine can work better. And of course, you can optimize your computing time when you're trying to search for something. So 
structural logs makes your life easier because you can do also filtering. You can say, please drop the whole messages that has a status uh, 500. We don't care when the server was down for some reason. And also to perform any kind of analytics. So from the cloud native perspective, we have a logging pipeline, but also we need to be aware about distributed system. We need to have strategies for applications. And also keep in mind that we want to centralize the logs. And that's what FluentD is. FluentD is an open source project under the Apache license and now under the CNCF hands, which allows you to implement a full logging pipeline in your architecture. And it does buffering. Buffering and also does filtering, which is really good. So as we said, we have more than 700 plugins available. We have reliability, security, and also, well, uh, it's written in Ruby and C. We have some feedback sometimes that, okay, this is written in Ruby, it's not too fast, but it depends on the use case. And FluentD is being used for more than 2,000 companies. Just the open source version, imagine that. So Nintendo is, is using FluentD. And did you play Pokemon Go? Yeah. Well, the good thing is that that was deployed with Kubernetes, one of the beta Kubernetes cluster, and that was running FluentD too. We didn't know until, until we read the news. It was like, it's not like, oh, okay, we were working with Google to come out. No, it was not like that. You know, they are <laughs> pretty quiet. So, but as we said, also FluentD is more than a project. We consider FluentD as a login full login ecosystem. But you get some feedback. You go to conference, you go to meetups, you talk to our users, you go to Slack, and sometimes they say, you know what? We need something lightweight. I have this problem. The performance is good, but can we make it better? And I think that that's the goal, right? Making things better every day. And always, I wish future A, B, C, and D. So from that perspective, like two years ago, we decided to start a new project to fix uh, some missing gaps in FluentD where six years ago, we didn't have too much concepts about cloud native or that kind of things. FluentD works really well, but we also think that we can make it better. We can make it better as a FluentD, but also as an ecosystem. So from a new ecosystem, we come up with FluentBit project. And FluentBit was started uh, almost two years ago with the same philosophy. Just, just try to implement a login pipeline, but also make it compatible with FluentD, meaning that you can make talk FluentBit with FluentD. You know that FluentD also can talk over the network with different services, but also with other FluentDs. So FluentBit also can take out the logs from your services and talk to a remote FluentD or any kind of destination that is supported, of course. The highlights of FluentBit is that reading in C language, <coughs> Most of people say, hey, why you didn't write it in Golang? Well, the answer is we started the project two years ago. That's the first answer. Two years ago, and we wanted to have it a very reliable uh, solution for ARM architecture. And two years ago, Golang was not really well, did not play, play very well on, on ARM. So, and also I think that if you want to build something that really scales and you know, you know the language, because you can make C slow also. It's not just a language. It's also, if you know how, how to make it right, you can increase performance, you can optimize from many angles. So that's why we choose C. It has a pluggable architecture. We support more than 35 plugins at the moment. It's asynchronous, event-driven, support TLS, security, and also monitoring capabilities. And some of the plugin that, that we have available, we can tell log files, we can listen from messages from systemd, uh, we can parse syslog messages, listen for messages over the network. Uh, we can also get metrics. Uh, we were talking about this today with some guys. One of the first plugins of FluentBit to get information from was from the CPU, to measure the CPU where FluentBit is running as a whole. Then we added memory, disk, network, and other more. Uh, also, as part of the pipeline, we implemented filters, like Kubernetes filters. So if you're working in a Kubernetes cluster, as I said, you want to get some notion from where the logs are coming from or where do they belong to. 
because you are not going to query the logs. You're going to say, please show me the whole logs that belongs to the pod name X, B. But you need to have that kind of metadata. Filters allows you to parse or to modify the records, means add your own custom information. And as an output destination, we support Elasticsearch, InfluxDB, Kafka REST, and NETS, HTTP, and we're going to support Kafka now, native Kafka. And the primary focus of FluentBit is Kubernetes and Docker, of course, the cloud native space. It can work everywhere, but if you said, I'm using my Raspberry Pi and I have a bug, and comes another person say, I have a bug in Kubernetes, you know what we are going to solve first. So we always get some pushback about that, but uh, we try to prior, make some prioritization about the issues. So let's jump into now, we talk about login in general, right? Now let's talk about Kubernetes and login, and for that I need to give you some context, very general context, about how things work in Kubernetes. If you have the notional application, that's your goal of a cluster, you're going to deploy an application. Basically, this application runs in a, in a container, right? But a container in Kubernetes belongs to a pod, and a pod can have many containers. So here you start to see, okay, logging becomes complex. Because you can have also many pods inside a node. A node can be a, a host very meta machine or a virtual machine. And in a cluster, these start to grow. Sometimes you can spin up more nodes, drop nodes, application, you can scale applications. So how do we implement a, the logging pipeline at this level to make it right? So in Kubernetes, there is a concept which is called daemon set. And a daemon set is a pod that runs on every node of the cluster, okay? So if you want to solve logging, the first thing that you need to do is, of course, read the logs, right? So using FluentBit or FluentD as a daemon set allow us, with the right configuration, of course, to read the application's log files, which belongs to the container engine. In this case, could be Docker. So once you read the information, what you do is to go to the API server because you want to get some extra information from that container. Remember that the application does not know that it's running in a container. It don't care about its Kubernetes or it's running on Swarm, it doesn't matter. But from a logging perspective, what we want to solve in an address is just to give it the notion about where these logs belongs to. So what do we do is that every time that we are parsing the logs, Every, every log message, we go to the API server, if we don't have the information, and we append the labels and annotation to that specific record. We are going to see that now in a demo. Okay, so once we collect the whole information, we centralize the output in our database, or we can send the data also to multiple places. That is one of the flexibility of FluentD and FluentBit. Okay, let's make a, a quick demo. Who's familiar with Kubernetes here? Raise your hand again. Okay, so I can, we can use, can you see my screen? Or oh, is too, okay. kubectl, get notes, micro, okay, get rain. Okay, I'm running Minikube, which is a single Kubernetes node cluster running the computer because I had a problem this morning with my real cluster. So what we're going to do is something very basic. As you saw, we don't have any pods running here. But I'm going to deploy an application that will generate just a dummy message to Kubernetes. A dummy message which means to the, a dummy log message. So I'm going to run it as a deployment I'm going to call it JSON. And this is the image. You can take it if you want. So. Oh, JSON is running. 
So my pod application is running here. So just let's take, let's look at the logs. So what this application is doing is just writing, so I have, you know, well, it's a map here, it's a JSON map. So we are writing just every second a dummy message to the standard output. What I'm doing is I deploy an application that writes a message, and that's it. I'm querying the information with cube control. Okay, that is one thing. But of course, in a real scenario, for, for to see the logs of your application, maybe you're not going to use kubectl logs. You're going to ship the logs somewhere and then do something other magic, black magic, okay? So the application is running, and then what I to, want to do right now is to centralize these logs in a place. And for the purpose, we are going to use Elasticsearch. Okay, so this is the um, watch thing and two. Okay, what I'm doing is like every second, I'm querying the Elasticsearch HTTP endpoint to see if we have some index or we have some documents or some information there, okay? There is nothing. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is to deploy Fluentbit, which will allow me, with the default configuration that I just ingested, of course, just to take out the logs of the whole pods or application that are running and ingest that information back into Elasticsearch. So, if you wanna see the, the daemon set file, it's a daemon set. Here we have the image, right? Very basic. We are talking to Elasticsearch, which is my local host, because it's Minikube, that's the magic IP. The TCP port address, and that's it. Those are the volumes that we need to learn to read the application logs, okay? So kubectl create. Okay. Kubectl get pawn. Okay, so fluent bit it's fluent bit is already running. And if it, everything is right, I'm going to see some logs here. Do, do, do. Ah, as it's refreshing. Okay, if you see every second or every two seconds, depends on the delay of the, of the buffer, you are going to see that the number of documents is increasing. That means that something is ingesting data into my Elasticsearch. Well, we assume that it's fluent bit, right? It is, so that's why I show you that there's nothing there. Okay, so if my memory, I mean the computer memory allows me, I'm going to try to run Kibana, which is a log visualization tool. I'm not an expert on Kibana, but I want to show you how the logs looks like in Kibana. Kubecon, oh, service Kibana start. Okay. So let's open Google, Chrome. So this should be, that's port. Kibana, if you're not familiar with this, I just ingested the data into Elasticsearch, which is the storage, the database, but also they have another component from the ecosystem, which is called Kibana, which allows you to generate some graphics or query the information in the database. I'm going to create this. Oh, I need, to. it's just fresh. Okay, create. Oh, the full pattern. Thanks. Dun, dun, dun. Okay. 
OK. I'm going to switch this to auto refresh every five seconds. OK. Here, some logs are coming in. OK. But what I want to show you is the structure of the logs. Can you still see? OK. So here, I'm going to do a query, Kubernetes that, oh. And I'm going to pause. OK. What I did is I told Kibana, please show me the whole logs that comes from Kubernetes and have some pod name which start with JSON. Do you remember that we started a pod called JSON in the beginning? OK. That's it. So here, we have many records. I'm going to open this one. And I'm going to open the JSON version. OK. What I want to tell you is that every single line that was generated, very simple at the beginning in the terminal, now gets a bunch of information that add also adds a notion about from where and what this log means. If you look at here, we have a Kubernetes metadata. And check this. This is the pod name, the namespace, the pod ID, the labels, and all that information. And that is really important. So if you're going to do logging for Kubernetes, your login agent, it doesn't matter if you use FluentD, FluentBit or not, but you need to take care about metadata because that is what you need in order to query the information. And if you look carefully, this is the message that I was printing to the screen. But also, the login tool was configured to decompose that message and make the fields and expose them in a different way. So for example, I'm looking at the record which printed the, the number 304 and also has that word. OK? So that is a, is a goal of any kind of logging solution. Be able to take off the logs, implement a kind of pi log, logging pipeline, work reliable, and also append metadata. And for Kubernetes, this is a must. You cannot ship logs without this. So that was the demo. And what's next? From a fluent bit perspective, we are releasing the version 0 0.13 at the end of the year. Well, actually, December 20, so before Christmas. So and it comes with the huge news that it comes with native support for Prometheus for monitoring. So you can monitor the login pipeline of fluent bit, where my records are parsed, how many bytes I'm consuming, how much I'm parsing, dropping, and send it out and also full integration with Apache Kafka. All of those are functional, but we are just doing some extra checks, extra tests. And well, thank you. <laughs>